My name is Dr. Robert O'Quinn, and I've been using this series of discussions to explore some of the unexpected benefits of COVID-19. I realize that sounds perverse, that benefits could come from a pandemic, uh, but I've been hearing lots of positive stories since the pandemic began, mostly revolving around the ability to live and work online from home. This, for me, this has been entertaining uh, to watch others discover the benefits of learning online from home. Uh, benefits that I've been enjoying for over a quarter century. Uh, our goal here today is to capture some of those discoveries and some of those stories and hopefully even some lessons learned. Today I want to explore these stories from student perspectives. Back in February of 2020, I told my own students, some of whom are participating today, uh, that we really don't need to worry very much about COVID-19. Uh, I thought it was going to be very localized and very short-lived. Um, and we all know uh, that was wrong, um, and it became very real not long after that when universities and colleges the world over um, began to either shut down or move completely online. And even then, uh, you'll remember, we, only th we thought it would only be a few weeks. Um, so this is one of the three panels hosted by Shaw Spotlight on this topic. The other two panels focus on teaching online and working online. Okay, so let's get our panel involved. Um, I'd like you to begin by having each of you introduce yourself. So uh, what's your name? What are you studying? Where are you studying? Um, could we begin maybe with Anjali? Yeah, sounds good. So I'm Anjali. Um, I am a going into my third year at Queen's University, and I am a global development major and a political studies minor. Um, and my interests kind of lie in global health. Tamara. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Tamara Fuller. I'm also um, in Global Development Studies going into my third year at Queen's. Um, and yeah, my interests are also in global health and global education. Good. Thank you. Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm also a Global Development Studies major. I'm going into my fifth year and uh, my interests are probably migration and refugees. Um, hi, Robert. Uh, my name is Jose Pablo Aguilar. I am from Costa Rica. Um, I am studying two universities. One is uh, University of Costa Rica. There I study be, um, be, uh, public administration, sorry, and in UNED, Universidad de la Estatal a Distancia, and I am studying business administration. Great. Thank you. That's great. So there's some variety here. Um, so we have three students based in Canada and one based in Costa Rica. So that's really, really interesting. And I'm familiar with the universities that you're at. One of them is an online university already. The, um, the other university is a tradition, more traditional face-to-face -face university. But I am curious, um, if I could start with Tamara. Uh, did you have experience learning online prior to COVID-19? Yeah, so I definitely had some experience. In high school, I took one online class in my grade 12 year. And then um, I've taken one pretty much every semester of university now. So not extensive experience, but definitely some that I've enjoyed. Great. Angelique? Yeah, same goes for me. I took one in grade 12. I kind of forgot about high school until you said that, but I did take one in grade 12. And every semester since I started university as well, just one per semester, I tried at least not to take two, but yeah. Okay, good. Emily? Yeah, I also have extensive uh, history working online. I prefer it. And so most semesters, I choose my courses based on what are available online to me because I really, really like them. Okay, good. And Jose, I know you've studied online. Can you tell us about some of your online experiences? Yes, well, in UNED, we use a platform. Well, actually, right now, there are two platforms that we can send uh, jobs. I actually have uh, tutors. And in UCR, obviously, well, it's face-to-face -face university, but uh, last year, one professor decided to, to change the rules. So we took, uh, well, we took a course uh, by Zoom. Actually, it was my first time to use that platform, and I, I like it very much. So for those of you who, um, you know, did, did online courses uh, in high school and so on, what was that transition like? Was it, was it difficult? to transition to, to online learning? I mean, you had been doing all of your courses face-to-face -face prior to that. 
Anjali, was that a difficult transition for you? The transition once the pandemic hit? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say the professors definitely made it easy on students, for sure. Um, a lot of my courses completely changed on weighting of assessments um, after the pandemic hit. So I think it made it easier for a lot of people. Um, in terms of difficulties, I think the only difficulty I had was adjusting moving back home. But then once I got into that, it was quite easy for me to write the few, very few exams that I had and kind of do my coursework after as well. Right, right. Tamara, what was that transition like for you? Yeah, I would say I had a very similar time. And I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge my privilege in this situation. I have good internet connection, quiet rooms to study in, stuff like that. So I think that made it a lot easier. And I know it's not like that for everybody. So, but yeah, the professors made it very accommodating and ensured that things were still fair, <laughs> quote unquote, with weighting of assessments because they knew that it's a stressful time and things were different. But yeah, relatively easy, I would say for me. Yeah. And it was a stressful time, right? Because just, I mean, in hindsight, it was kind of, okay, we just moved home and we moved online. Yeah. But at the time, and, you know, it's only three or four months ago, but at the time, we really had no idea what was going on. So, you know, anytime you're not sure, there's going to be stress. Emily, what was that transition like for you? I, it was similar. I, my professors were all very patient, which I, I was really appreciative about because we had shifted very rapidly um, to the online area. But I think it was really nice because we had already had an online platform going. A lot of lectures were posted online already. We had a lot of an online communication happening. So it wasn't anything too shocking. And I had immense amounts of support from all of my professors and they became very reliable and prompt with their communication so mm-hmm. it was easy to say that lightly okay that's good and jose i i'm imagining that your transition was probably a little more unusual than what we've heard so far just because you you learn at a face-to-face university and also at an online university Yes, exactly. Well, in one university, it's more easier. Um, actually, it's bit that way. Uh, I prefer to learn online and to face-to-face. University of Costa Rica, I remember that I went only two days in March, and they, they say, go home. <laughs> and well, here we are. Uh, but yeah, the transition was um, easier because we have a platform that it's called Mediación Virtual. So all the jobs are there. Maybe not classes in that time, but we send all and work already in that platform. Okay. Ob- obviously, well, in my case, I, I try to, to change my, my house a little bit because I need a place to to get more focus. And have got- in fact, that's a good segue. I was just going to ask, was there anything special you had to do to make that transition? So you had to you had to adjust your house a little bit. Yes. Was there anything else you had to do? And buy another computer because, well, my mom right now we're here and so right. we need to be both connect at the same time. Right. So that's definitely a challenge, right? And not everyone is able to do that. So yes. for sure, that's great that you were able to do that. Um, Emily, did you have to do anything special to make that transition? Definitely. I, I'm one of those people who really need a busy background to focus. I don't know why. I just, whenever I'm studying, I go to loud places. So being in isolation, I it was definitely a learning curve about how to stay on track. Um, having music playing in the background really helped uh, when I moved back home with my parents. Um, it was always nice and loud there. So Definitely having to keep my boundaries with getting distracted, but also staying focused. Right. You, we couldn't work in the same room. <laughs> for, for me, the, the, it was strange because uh, this office that I work in, I work here all the time, but the door that's there is my kitchen. And uh, I'm not used to having people at home. And so every once in a while, I'll see someone walk by the kitchen and I'm going, what's going on? Why are there people in my house? Um, so no, we couldn't work together. I don't think. So. <laughs> and yeah. did you have to do anything special? 
I want to say nothing drastic. Um, The only thing is I haven't really um, had like a proper desk studying area since I moved out um, in first year or moving into first year. Like I took my chair from my room. I have a small desk, but I have a lot of random stuff on it that I kind of keep to the side. Um, But lucky enough, I kind of had claimed the basement when I needed to like do work since it was me my mom my dad and my brother all working from home the three of them were working from home and I was also doing my schoolwork so we all kind of claimed our areas in a sense so like my mom had her dining room my dad had the living room my brother had the kitchen or his room and I had the basement so other than that there was nothing really special like Nothing drastic, I would say. Okay. Tamara? Yeah, I was, I was thinking of your response because it was very similar to mine. All of a sudden, for the first time in four years, pretty much, everybody was back in the house. So my dad was working from home. My sister was studying for her nursing exams. And you're we kind of all toppling on top of each other. But um, in the end, it, you know, the same thing. We ended up with our own space and kind of got to the groove of things. But at the beginning, definitely you know, it was a transition. There's no doubt about that. But, um, but yeah, just finding, finding your space, finding the patterns, talking with friends, uh, you know, still kind of having that flexibility with the social aspect of classes, I think was an important transition as well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So we're about four months in, um, to COVID-19. Um, we're mostly going to be online for the fall. Uh, with a few exceptions. I had a meeting yesterday. I don't think I'm telling tales out of class. I had a meeting yesterday that basically said, what would teaching online in the winter of 2021 look like? And I thought, hmm, that's a very subtle way of suggesting we may still be online in 2021. Um, So we're kind of settled in in a way and in a way we're not but what what are some of the positives or negatives for that matter that that you've seen uh about about uh, being online learning online in particular um tomorrow since you're there why don't we start with you yeah um i think i mean everybody talks about the flexibility of it but i really do think that that's one of the biggest positives um having the ability to study where you want and where you need not that we could go very many places in isolation, but it is nice to be able to kind of carve out your own time and create your own timeline of assignments and lectures and stuff like that. For me, I'm a very self-regulated learner and I am organized in my own way. So I think it was nice to have that opportunity with online learning. Uh-huh. But, yeah. Yeah. Emily, what, what sorts of positives or, or negatives for that matter have you seen or observed or experienced? Um, I think that connecting uh, with people online on a deeper level was definitely a positive aspect. It's hard to build those relationships at first online and people tend to shy away from change. So when this was all happening, we saw a lot of people, students and professors alike, step up their support systems with one another. We yep. became engaged. Um, even today, like we're chatting with someone in Costa Rica So it's really bringing us together way across the map. And like, I just, I can't be more appreciative that I get to stay safe and healthy from a distance and learn at the same time. So honestly, I'm just incredibly grateful that we have this platform to utilize. Yeah, no, it's, it's been really good for sure. Jose, what, uh, what are some of the positives for you or, or negatives? I haven't heard any negatives and that's okay. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I think here in Costa Rica, one negative thing is the uh, economic gap, uh, because in some areas they they don't have connection to internet or even a computer, so it's 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 difficult. Most in high school, that or a school that they have uh, problems with that. Actually, here uh, public universities uh, bought um, tablets to help the students to try to to be connect um yes but i think that most it's it's positive in my case um saving time uh try to organize very well and yes i'm um, for example right here in costa rica it's like the season of rain so i can stay here in my house yeah yes now, now when you say save time what do you mean 
uh, try to organize my time very well. For example, to seven to nine, I have classes, then maybe take a little break and then go to study and try to do different things. For example, online courses, they tell me right now. Good, good. Angeli, what, what are some of the, what have your experiences been? Um, I feel like there aren't, in my opinion, there aren't many negatives. I think the one negative but it goes into a positive is just the transition period of really getting into the groove of things. It took me a while moving um, home and getting used to it. And by the time I kind of got used to it, it was just exams and then it was done. Mm -hmm. So September will definitely be an adjustment um, doing five courses online rather than just one and then four in person. But I think it's going to give me and a lot of people structure and like Jose said, um, time management um, utilizing their time better. And I do know a lot of people that are planning on taking, instead of five courses, taking two or three courses and picking up a, a full-time job as well, which I think will help a lot of people. And they're okay with either taking, picking up some summer courses or taking another semester if needed. But I think that's one of the really positive things that come out of this. There's a lot of, um, a lot of room for people to be open and see what they want to do with their time as well. Tamara, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, yeah. Um, personally, I really like, in terms of setup of, you know, the actual software, I guess, I love that they have timelines. You don't really get that in um, Paste, or I haven't at least. I don't know if that's common, but, and I love just being able to see what I have to do for the week. It's already set up. It makes it really simple. It's that part I really like. And also, pretty much every online class I've taken has had an element of a discussion forum almost every week or bi-weekly. And for me, I, I love the tutorials where you can speak to people and, you know, discuss, have good conversation, but it can be intimidating when it's new information and new things that you've learned. So I find being able to write down my thoughts and then talk with my peers is really helpful in the online platform because I can think about it, you know, and, compare my answers, stuff like that. So it's a bit less intimidating. Yeah. yeah. Emily, I see you nodding your head. Is that, has that been a, a theme for you as well? Yeah, 100%. I, I have so much anxiety when I go to class and often I don't raise my hand. I know in your course I did, but that was because I was very well versed on the topics. But often I hesitate to say what I'm thinking because I, I'm too anxious to say it out loud. But when it's online, you have time to think about it. You have time to erase your thoughts and revise and, and go back and really like ensure that what you're saying is what you want to say. And that way you don't have that pressure of having 50, 100, 500 people looking right at you and listening to you. I know it's a big pressure for a lot of people and I really like the online environment for that particular reason. Yeah. And, th and that's something that's really common. Like if you read literature about online learning, that's considered one of the standard advantages. And, uh, and you're right, it is scary. Uh, even when there's only 20 people, you know, to, to have all these people looking at you and you're not sure that you're right. You're not sure that you have the right answer, right? Um, Jose, is, have you seen anything like this? Is this? Would you say this is common in your uh, learning experience in Costa Rica too? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Because, right. well, some teachers only read, the, for example, a PowerPoint present that sometimes maybe can be boring, but I have one professor in particular that he, for example, he used uh, his iPad, so he tried to to use different programs to help us to to think different, to learn different, and I think that um, other professors can can do that and help us to yeah to to be a different way. Yeah, mm -hmm. Angeli, you want to. Um, what I was kind of thinking of is like, I feel like we've all kind of been in a situation where a prof kind of goes too quick on their PowerPoint and you can't type quick enough. Mm -hmm. So for PowerPoints to be online, either it, they put it, they make it more detailed, they've made it more detailed, or they have a voice recording of them talking and expanding. So you can like pause it 
type what you need to type or write what you need to write and then keep it going. So in a sense, you get more description of um, the course content, which I really like. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is something that I talk to profs about quite a lot. And I say, you know, this is standard practice in online learning, but you know, you could be doing this in your face-to-face -face classes too. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm actually hoping for me as a professor that that's going to be one of the benefits that, that when we do go back to face-to-face, -to -face, a lot of the lessons that we've learned in the online environment will get translated to face-to-face. -to -face. But, but I've been saying this for 25 years and it hasn't happened yet, but anyway, I'll try not to take it too personally. Um, good. No, those are really, really interesting things uh, and really, really helpful, I think. Um, you know, Tamara acknowledged early on that, you know, I think we all on this panel are a little bit privileged. Uh, and I think we need to acknowledge that. And, you know, not to say we haven't had struggles and, and that we haven't had to deal with things. We have. Uh, but I think I, I worry that some people are still struggling. Um, some of them are struggling with, with barriers. Sometimes it's technological barriers. Uh, sometimes it's what I would call pedagogical barriers, um, you know, barriers with the new style of teaching. Sometimes it's uh, more sort of psychosocial barriers uh, or barriers with, uh, you know, being disciplined. You do have to be disciplined in online learning, right? We, we learned that. So I think some people are probably still struggling. And so I'd like to ask you, you all if you have tips for people who might still be struggling a little bit with online learning. Um, can, maybe we'll start with Tamara again. Yeah, um, I definitely think there's a lot of my friends too that when the transition happened, they've never taken an online course and they don't really know how to keep track of dates and assessments and stuff like that when they don't have somebody reminding them, which is a completely fair thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard. Um, so it, it might sound like a cliche or whatever, but, but staying organized is so important. And I find with, I'm taking summer courses right now. And the minute they open, I get my calendar, get my planner, and I just write all the dates when each module needs to be done, when, you know, when things are coming up. Because when you're taking that many at a time, like we will be in, in the fall, things can get lost in OnQ or in, you know, whatever software you're using. So so I think that's honestly the most important is just keeping track of your dates. And also though, on top of that, we are like a negative that I didn't say earlier, we are losing part of the social face-to-face -face interaction that you would. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I love going to class with my friends and sitting with them, you know, it's that kind of aspect. So I think it'll also be very important to create study groups or create times where you can FaceTime or use Zoom to talk about the content because you are losing that. So I think that's one way to kind of mitigate the negative side that people might struggle with. Yeah, and I think that's really important. I mean, obviously I'm biased because I, you know, this is my specialty is online learning, but I recognize that number one, it's not for everyone. And number two, it's not perfect, right? Yes, maybe try to adapt to change to the to the change. Uh, your attitude is very important because I I have friends that say it's not for me. I don't like it, and I say, okay, don't worry. It's uh, I, I understand that it's your first time, but take it easy. Uh, try to do different things. Um, management your time. But yeah, I think that your attitude, it's very important because uh, learning education, um, it, it came to stay. So for example, in UCR, we think that um, the first semester, obviously it's going to be online. So you need to, to change your yeah. way of think. And you're saying, I just want to clarify. So UCR is the University of Costa Rica and it's traditionally uh -huh. a face-to-face -face university, right? Yes, of course, yes. So I just, I want to further clarify that uh, at least for the fall, it's going to be completely online. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So in that sense, it's it's a lot like Queen's University, where, where the other participants go to. It's traditionally a face-to-face -face university, but now it's mostly online, at least for the next semester. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting comparison. Yeah. Anjali, do you have any tips for people who might be struggling a little bit? Um, I'd say... in similar to being organized, just having some sort of structure to your day, timing, um, 
time, like setting, like blocking out times. I'm going to do this um, between one to three. I'm going to do this chorus after that. Um, it is definitely a learning experience as it goes. You see how, how you adapt to change and everything, but definitely attitude and staying organized are two very important things. Yeah. What about, uh, and I, I'm just going to dump this on you. What about social isolation? Um, how would you, what would you recommend for dealing with that? It's honestly, it was very tough. I'm someone, again, love seeing my friends, love seeing my family, especially when I go home and when I whenever I go home for reading week for winter break anything like that I always see my family my extended cousins my nieces and nephews and I couldn't see any of them for almost two and a half months three months and it was it was weird for me but in a way we made do of it we had zoom calls we had like a family zoom call like almost once a week it was really nice Same with friends. And there was a lot of platforms that we stayed connected with. For example, there was Netflix Party, which you could watch a Netflix show or movie at the same time and chat at the same time. There was a lot of online games using Zoom. A lot of my clubs, we had um, club socials over Zoom and using the platforms on Zoom, the drawing board and all of that. Um, It was really nice, but social isolation can definitely take a toll on you. There's, there's no doubt about it. You're not seeing many people. Um, luckily, things are opening up a bit. Um, obviously, some people don't like going out and seeing people. Some people are happy it's happening. It's whatever you're comfortable with, pretty much. But yeah, a lot of people are going to have to I, I like adapt to that as well. And maybe finding people in your course, um, similar people in your course, meeting up with them, or even just doing work with one of your friends for a couple hours a day, a couple hours a week. Yeah. Definitely would change something similar to going to the library. For me, I think I, communication is definitely one thing that really helps me stay on track and, you know, engaging with my peers, with the discussion boards. Often, I'm not sure if every course, but I'm pretty sure a lot of them have just open forums that aren't just the weekly discussion boards. They're ones that you can just post a question on and all of your peers can see them. I know that the online course that I'm in right now, we have a, a group chat on on. Facebook Messenger, which really helps it become more of a prompt reply. There's so many people in there, they're bound to have an answer for you if you're seeking some kind of question. But I think I, one thing that's really important for me is communicating with my prof. Um, sometimes the layout of the course is really confusing. I think that you touched that touched on that in our course last semester where you were saying some of the courses are really not accessible online just yet. Um, And one of the ways that you can navigate it easily is just going and asking your professor, your TAs, if you have a question. Like if you're really struggling to find information on something, if you have to, if you're digging too deep and none of your peers know, just email them. And that's something that I like, I have always taken advantage of knowing that they're just there at the tip of my fingers. I feel bad for some of them because they are really good at replying within like a timely manner, nine times out of 10, they're really responsive. And it's a way of also building that connection, having that discussion with them. And now they're going to know who you are, too. So they've seen your name in the email. So when, whenever you're submitting an assignment, they're going to connect and say, oh, we already discussed that in a conversation online. This person knows this because we talked about it earlier. So I'd say definitely communicate with your professor. Uh, via online. I know some people don't like to do that, but it's something I always do the second that my course opens. I just, I like to go in, see who my prof is, uh, introduce myself, just like you would if you were in like a brick and mortar setting, like going into a lecture. If you were raising your hand or going to see your professor after class, talking to them can just make things so much easier for you and take off a lot of stress. Yeah. And if I could sort of add to that a little bit, what I'm hearing you say in addition to all that is that if you're not seeing something, 
uh, take the initiative. So you were saying most of the courses have like a general form for discussion or maybe a chat room. Uh, if you don't see it, uh, either ask for it or create one yourself, mm -hmm. Facebook or whatever, and invite people. Um, so yeah, I would always encourage that as well. And, and speaking as a prof, again, nine times out of 10, we really appreciate it when students contact us somehow, either through email or whatever, uh, and it doesn't really matter. Uh, and just as an aside, the other thing I'll say for completely online courses, if you're using a learning management system, uh, there's a facility for you to upload a picture of yourself. That's really helpful. We really like it when students do that because it just makes our lives so much easier. But uh, no, those are great. Um, Tamara? Well, I think that it's it's important also to recognize like the prof a lot of these professors are having the transition as well. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting time for everybody. And um, I'm the same where I, I like to go up to my TAs and, you know, talk through essays or papers, stuff like that. Um, so I think maintaining that level of communication at, within the online courses, it shouldn't really change. And as long as the profs, which, I mean, I would say all do as long as they have empathy for the situation and for people that may not be comfortable with online learning, then it shouldn't be that much of a change with the communication styles. Yeah, for sure. And, I, and I'm glad you acknowledged the fact that professors are by and large in transition as well. Uh, I'm not going to give you any details. Let's just say I've gotten a lot of panicked emails from profs um, at universities really all over the world um, because that's what I do for a living um, because it really was thrust upon them with not a lot of preparation not a lot of warning uh, and very little training so um, I'm really glad that you acknowledge that um, you know they're doing their best um, but you know we're people too um, and on that point though uh, what, what, what would sort of be the number one thing you'd like to say to your professors about online learning like is there anything they could do or say or stop doing or saying that would, would make your learning experience better. Um, since we're with Tamara, maybe I'll just continue with you. It sounds kind of strange to say it to a professor, but as long as they stay organized, you'll stay organized. And a lot of times you'll go on to um, the online learning platform and you know you can't find things you can't find the syllabus you can't find the modules or stuff like that and that makes it really hard to be motivated and to be positive about the experience if it isn't laid out in a nice way <laughs> um, and I think also kind of I guess on a more specific note I really enjoy when the modules are either all available and all the readings are all available because sometimes they do the like time release ones and I'm sure you probably you obviously know more about the benefits to each option but I think you know online learning is made for flexibility and I think kind of restricting that is sometimes not good especially for students who might want to get ahead in certain things if they know they have a busy week so I think that also is something to consider for professors if they're creating a new online class. Yeah no and those are valid points and and there are few reasons in my experience to hide modules. Uh, occasionally, it, you want to do that, but not very often. And, and the other thing, again, and, and I don't mean this to be defensive at all, because it's not, uh, but oftentimes we're given online courses, and literally we're just said, you know, handed, and here you go. Interesting. And, and, it's, and so we founder, and we're like drowning too at the same time, trying to figure out, I'm actually going through it right now, uh, trying to figure out where the syllabus is, and even in one case, where the table of contents is for the course, it, you know, it took me an hour to figure out where to where to get all that sort of stuff. So it is definitely a learning experience, and and uh, but you're right. I mean, the better that that we are organized, then the better uh, you're going to be served in terms of your learning experience for sure. Um, Angelique, what what's the number one thing you'd like to say to your crops? I'd say, yeah, communication, discussion posts, I think making sure, especially because, again, talking about the whole idea of social isolation, you won't be seeing many people. Um, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see how group work is going to play out. I've done online courses where there's been group work done and it works out pretty well. Um, but how often group work will be I guess we'll see. I think communication between students will also be helpful um, for the prof and other students, especially if it is a core 
course that you're taking, for example, if it is a core devs course, you might be able to talk to someone in your group about, oh, by the way, did you do the assignment for this other class? I personally um, don't know a lot of people in devs in my year. Um, obviously, meeting Tamara, who's going into third year, is a, a big thing. But yeah, <laughs> communication. So I mean, that's good advice. And would you say that that we should be doing that um, even in the online environments, that we should still be doing group work? I think so, yes. Um, again, um, going back to privilege, um, a lot of people have access to laptops and good Wi-Fi, so I think it won't it won't be too hard for um, a handful of people. But I was um, for one of my online courses, um, global health that I took last semester, and it was moved online. We had a few, we had one group project um, once COVID hit, but there was one group member that didn't have the most access to the Wi-Fi. Um, so we all had to accommodate, which was no problem at all. The teaching team knew that it was obviously something that they had to deal with as well. And of course, being accommodating to that as well, as well as group members being vigilant of it. Yeah. And that, you know, from a, from a professor's point of view, like that in, a, in and of itself is a learning experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's value in that and, and working through those issues and coming up with solutions to those issues. Absolutely. Um, Jose, what, what's one thing you'd like to say to your profs about learning online? Uh, well, that they are not alone, that we can help them. Because, well, here most of the teachers don't have experience working in this way. So we are the generation of technology, so we can help them if they need help. We can be able to, to understand that, them and help. For example, well, I have um, this last semester one teacher that here in Costa Rica, we don't have like the attitude to, to put our cameras to the classes. No, we only our mics and that's it, mm -hmm. our microphones. So uh, at the end of the class, she said, please um, turn on your camera. I want to see you take a picture. And I think that's uh, for her, oh my God, that was amazing. But we are like a teacher again. <laughs> but yes, I think to, to help them, to have the, the attitude to, to help. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and you're right. And, and professors will appreciate that, especially in the online environment, because we're not really used to it, right? It's kind of new for everyone. So, so we can learn from each other a lot. I think. Emily, what, what do you uh, One thing I... I think, Tamara, you said a word that was really important for me, and that was empathy. I think user empathy is definitely something that I, I would love to see from the profs. I know that we're all being challenged right now with uh, making this as accessible and efficient as possible. Uh, understanding that there's people out there who may not have the same kind of accessibility as everyone else is very important when designing your course. So I think with the online course I'm in right now, part of my grade even is doing a survey, an end of term survey about how I liked the online course. And I think that is just incredibly important and very beneficial. So if I were to say something to my profs where for some of the courses that have been hard to not navigate, I know you said you were having trouble navigating one, is maybe I'm... Um, if it comes down to it at the end of the term, you have time to, to reevaluate. And I don't know how the system works or if you're able to talk to the head of departments or talk to IT about how to rearrange the course and make it more accessible, make it easy, uh, easier to just navigate. I think that's always the number one thing for me that frustrates me in some courses is navigation. That hasn't happened to me for a long time. Um, recently, the online navigation is super easy. On the left-hand side, you have all of your tabs that are just listed right there. So it's easy to just in your face about what's happening, what's coming up, what you need to do, what you need to read. So I think um, definitely understanding that we have four or five other courses that we're also trying to navigate and 
if it's becoming frustrating for us to try and, and organize the course for you, it's just going to add more, more stress and really take away from the course content. You know, you're deterring from the whole point of the course if you're stuck trying to figure out where things are laid out. Um, it's, I, th- I don't know if it's easily ex- uh, fixable, sorry. I don't know if it's just like a, a button or an email or something you have to talk to. I'm sure there's a big drawn out process of how you can reorganize a course. But ask us, really. Like, I think that's just asking our opinions is going to help everyone in the long run because you know nobody gained anything by staying quiet right so that communication i think will benefit the future generations who are going to utilize the uh, online learning environment as well yeah and i think that's really valuable um the process that you're talking about is called formative evaluation and and we are supposed to be doing it and and in terms of changing the courses, the way you're like restructuring them and that sort of stuff, there's absolutely nothing stopping us from doing that. Mm. Uh, If I, the course that I'm going to be teaching this fall, if I want to wipe it clean and start over again, I can do that. Mm. Um, You know, there are a few restrictions, but not very many. So there's absolutely nothing technical or administrative stopping us. It's political will. So Mm. will, will they do it? Um, Will they make those changes? Will they do the formative evaluation with the students? And that's that's an open question. Some some people will, and some people won't. Right? It's um, yeah, it's a it's a very complicated and very politically charged uh, issue. But I mean, your points are well taken, and I and I hope you know that profs will will consider that. And I would encourage you to discuss that with your profs um, and and just see what they think. Um, Tamara, did I see you wanted to add something? Um, I don't think so, honestly. I think everybody touched on, yeah, on definitely the key things. Okay. So this is almost the same question, but sort of a just variation on it. Eventually, uh, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later, this COVID-19 thing is going to end. We're maybe going to get a vaccine or a treatment or I don't know what's going to happen, but it will end. I'm optimistic about that. Um, what, what would you like to see sort of in a post-COVID-19 world? And, and feel free to really... Uh, you know, go in any direction you want on this question, but but if you need a little bit of help, like what, what are you hoping your professors or future employers will do? Will they, you know, are you hoping you'll be able to work, learn and work more online or, you know, what, what, what are, what's your vision, I guess? But don't, don't feel you have to stick to those topics. Uh, tomorrow, since we'll, we'll start again with you since you're there. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, I definitely think personally, I would love to see a hybrid of what we're living through now and what we were living <laughs> through before. Um, I think that having that flexibility again it seems to keep going back to that but um helps for a number of people in a number of ways um especially being a student in this space um a lot of courses are only offered in one semester and you have to choose between the fall and the winter and for me i've i've been wanting to take some but they don't fit in my schedule or stuff like that and so it would be nice to have the opportunity to take courses that might not have fit in your fall and you can take them in the winter um stuff like that and I think that having both would be really beneficial and um for working at home as well I think um a lot of people enjoy that that side of it and being able to maybe go into the office a few days a week but also having the time to work at home. I know my dad has been working at the cottage and, you know, so stuff like that. It's, it's different, but I think it's something that could be beneficial in the future. And I think that should stay after this. So, so a more blended approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Jose, what would you like to see? Well, I think the same opinion of Tamara. Um, I like both. Um, Obviously online it's, sometimes it's better but to, fa- to be with your friends but face to face to have social life it's very important great. so yeah for me it's both great Emily what would you like to see um I liked the idea of uh, making it a hybrid I think one of the things I think would be really important in future online if there's like I emphasis online is um, synchronization I know I uh, asynchronous learning is often what the case with uh, with online learning 
but I think synchronous learning is, is really cool. I had it, I've only ever taken one course where there was secret synchronous learning. I know that it kind of uh, defeats the purpose of the flexibility of online learning because you usually have your scheduled time of your lecture. You just attend it virtually. Uh, and I, I took that and it was really, really cool. It was so cool. You'd attend your first lecture and then we were sent into breakout rooms, which was just really so revolutionary because I, you were working alongside your peers virtually and, and making these connections and, and learning these new topics and having these discussions. And then even the prof would join your breakout room every now and then during your session and come in and offer their support or a TA would. Um, so I, I think definitely hybrid, but in the version of bringing in a little bit of um, synchronization between like the marriage of being online, but also live, yep. if you know what I mean. Oh, I know. Really, yeah, it benefits, right? That way you're live with your teacher right there and can have those conversations just as if you were in a classroom. Yep, yep. And I think in some organizations that's easier to do than in others. So, um, you know, I teach at a number of universities and there are some universities where I could do that. And there are some universities where I couldn't because I literally have students in all the time zones around the world. So there's no way that you could schedule those live sessions. But your point is well taken, I think. I mean, there is, there is value in having that, that live experience, right? And, and the breakout rooms, I agree, are fantastic. I use them a lot uh, when I can, and uh, they work really well. They, they speak to a lot of the issues that we've talked about today, like socialing, socialization and getting to know our peers and that sort of stuff. So no, I think, I think that that point is very, very well taken. Yeah. Anjali, what, what would you like to see? What's your vision? Again, fully agree with the hybrid. Um, if I'm getting more specific, um, ideally, I think um, lectures online, tutorials in person, or having some sort of meeting once a week with a TA, um, like I said, I brought up earlier the whole idea of I feel like um, lectures are more detailed when they're posted online, um, especially when the teacher can't um, or teacher professor can't um, uh, say it in a lecture. So I feel like for me personally, I would like that. And then still having a TA and a support group to discuss things like readings. Um, that's what most of Deb's tutorials um, would be like. But yeah, definitely would be helpful for everyone, including the TAs, getting feedback, what um, students may not know, um, what they're fully aware of what's going on in the class and getting more clarification going on. Okay. Now, this is an impossible question to answer, but I'm gonna ask anyway. Do you have a sense of what your friends and colleagues are thinking about? Like, do they, are they just sort of sitting at home, oh, I want this to end so I can go back to what it was before? Or are they kind of going, you know, there's some interesting things going on. What, what, what is your sense? Um, I feel like in terms of friends, I feel like the ones that I go to Queens with, um, I feel like all of them are just very curious to see what it's going to be like in September. I live in a house with five other girls, so it's six of us, and all of us plan on moving back to Kingston just because we feel like we can do work better here. But again, six of us being home 24-7 all the time could be some more butting heads. We'll, we want more quiet in the house if some people are doing work and whatnot. Obviously, during the school year, people are in and out of the house from pretty much 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. and onwards, so it's never all of us, all six of us in the house at a time. So it's definitely going to be something we're all curious to see what it's going to be like as well. Um, thinking about family members who all have a job, I know personally my mom, she got back to work. Um, she got to go back into the office after May long weekend, so end of May, beginning of June, and she was ecstatic. She was like so happy. She got structure back to her day, everything. But then my other cousins, they're like, I'm so happy my office isn't opening until January 2021. I feel like I have such a good thing going on at home. I learned how to cook. They can they can go to the gym or work do home workouts um, more than they would at work. 
you're not spending a lot of money on food as the whole culture of corporate culture of going out for drinks and food after they're not spending all of that um and then one of my cousins he's like i'm never going back to the office there's no reason for me to go back to the office i can do it all from home and i'm totally okay with that i don't have to do the commute and yeah so a real variety of experiences and, and even in my case like i i've been working from home for a long time and and um and it's just interesting to have my family around me all the time. And, and I have thought, you know, at some point, my kids are going to go back to school and my wife's going to go back to work because she has a real job. And that's going to be sad, you know, because they're going to be gone, right? Um, I kind of like having them around. So so I think there is probably a world of, of experiences out there. Absolutely. Um, Emily, did you, what, what, what is your sense of what other people are thinking of? Um, I... I think that it all is uh, subjective to the person, honestly. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely one of those people who just kind of ride with the wave. Whatever comes up my way just comes my way. I, I know for some of my other friends, they were very ecstatic to be coming back to Kingston because home life got a little bit too much for them. I uh, understandably so. I know for some people that things didn't even shift. Like my mother, for example, never stopped going into the office. Like she was essential in her in her uh, role. So that never changed for her. Uh, it's definitely different on the person. So I think that whatever you feel needs to be best for your safety just do that i know that student life definitely is an interesting place to be during a pandemic i think that we definitely get lost in the thought of being with our friends making those connections and it's important to realize that like social distancing is still needing to be done uh, we need to be focusing on being respectful of others as well i moved back to kingston and still, it's a, a weird time. I think that come September, there's going to be a lot of shock for people who move back, expecting things to just go back to normal because it's not going to be. It's it's going to be a long, drawn-out process of just adjusting to this new online social distancing kind of culture that we've we created for ourselves, which I think, um, given the right mindset, you can make it positive. I've had a really good experience of connecting with friends all over the globe. So definitely making sure that you have the good attitude and mindset to appreciate the times that we're living in and appreciating your health. Yeah. And, and you've mentioned that a couple of times and I meant to follow up and I didn't, but I think those are critical issues, you know, health and safety. And, and a subtext to that is it's not just being healthy and safe. It's feeling healthy and safe, right. And, and secure and that kind of security. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think that's so important. Yeah. Particularly in this case, because it is such an unknown. Right? Yeah. And like, not even for yourself. I think uh, it, it frustrates me because we're seeing a, a lot of these news headings come out of like uh, parties and social gatherings of up to 200 people in Brampton, I, I read. And I just think that uh, respecting others is definitely something that we need to keep at the forefront of our minds, you know? I, I forget even sometimes just like bring your mask everywhere, respect the two meter rule, really lower your going out. You know, you don't have to go out every day. You don't need to go to a grocery store every day. <laughs> My mother. <laughs> so it's just, it's just making sure that you're safe, but you're also keeping other people safe as well. And that's why I'm, I'm, eternally grateful for online learning because think about it if we if this had hit 50 years ago we would be stopping education like we would be putting our education on hold and that would be for another time but we are in a time where we can really continue to learn and continue to put our careers in motion yeah absolutely and it is a different way of thinking about things too i mean i, I you reminded me so i have teenage daughters and and, and when they, you know, go out there, I ask them the standard questions that fathers have asked their teenage daughters for the last thousand years, which is, where are you going? Where are you going to be with? How long are you going to be? Do you need a ride home? And now, do you have 
a mask. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, had I, six months ago even, had someone told me that I was going to be asking my teenage daughters whether they have a mask with them, I would have just said, you're crazy. That's that's (laughs) insane. Like, why would I ask them that? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so it's, it's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of adapting. It's about being open and flexible and so on. Um, I, I just, I don't want to cut anyone off and I just want to get a sense if anyone has any, uh, either responses to that question or final thoughts, any things that, anything that they'd like to add that maybe we missed or maybe they'd like to ask somebody else or a certain I just had a thought about um, kind of when you were talking about what friends and family are thinking right now. Um, I know that they're not all, obviously, but there are some people that have kind of a feeling of anger toward the situation because it is so out of our control. And I mean, it's human nature. We like to know where we're going, what we're doing. You know, it's that's just who we are. So I think kind of appreciating that that feeling for what it is and acknowledging it is important in this case because kind of as you said Kingston is still Kingston and I think a lot of students in our heads are thinking you know that is school and this is home and once we go back everything will be fine right but it's um so I think kind of preparing in that aspect and for a lot of my friends I think that transition will be hard um but in the end I think yeah like keeping your health at a priority and understanding that we are very lucky to still be able to be learning and um you know people have had jobs canceled co-ops canceled exchange terms stuff like that like it's not ideal but i think it's just really nice to be in a in a place where we're able to do this right now yeah and not to put you on the spot but do you have recommendations or ideas about how people should deal with their anger because you're right I think that there are some people who are well if you just watch the news you can see there are a lot of angry people out there uh, about how people can either deal with their own anger or if you're seeing anger in other people I don't mean to put you on the spot but no yeah I think I mean knowing and recognizing that that is the feeling that you're feeling I think that's priority um but also not dwelling on it for forever and I think if you you know mental health is really important in this time and reaching out to pe- to, to people and friends and um and there's a lot of resources at our school which is great and I think um you know using those is going to be important and um I guess to to kind of cope with the transition is you can research what you're getting yourself into Mm -hmm. like and try to find some control within the situation I think is what's helped me because I mean I've had moments where you know you just want to be sitting in a lecture hall and like who would have thought we would be saying that four months later but it's you know I think um, finding some sense of control through research and asking your profs asking your department heads stuff like that will be important. Yeah, I agree. And what I tell people, and this has come up a couple of times today already, is just talk to somebody. Um, Find somebody and talk to them. I have a very good friend who uh, is very much like me in that sense that he teaches a lot online, but he also teaches face-to-face. And But he doesn't live in this time zone. And uh, we just have a regularly scheduled meeting every Tuesday at 1.30. And it's in our calendars and we just do it. And sometimes we just get together and, hey, how you doing? And we just talk about you know, the weather or whatever, but sometimes we have very serious things that we need to talk about, but I know that I have that contact and he knows he has that contact and it's helped a lot um, to just get things out and answer stuff. So everyone should have someone like that or maybe multiple people like that for sure. Um, Jose, did you want to contribute to this? Well, um, maybe for learning online, I have an idea. For example, you take a course, but uh, for example, I don't know, maybe a different professor from another country can, can be with you. Um, for example, like this, to, to be with people with another, from another country, it can be help for us mm-hmm. and try to, to do different things. I think online can, can be used in that way. Mm-hmm. I want to thank you so much for your time and the wonderful insights uh, you all provided today. Um, I've been teaching online and developing online courses for over 25 years, but I, I really don't get a chance to meet with students in such an intimate way and uh, hear what you're thinking and feeling and experiencing. I've really learned a lot today, um, as has our audience, I'm sure. So Tamara and Emily and Anjali and Jose, I'd really like to thank you all for your time and stories. 
and I want to wish you all the best in the time of COVID-19.